Yo, 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 what's up all you burner stoners and potheads out there? This is Weedman420 with the Weedman420 Chronicles. How's all you burner stoners and potheads doing out there? Mrs. Weedman, how you doing? Doing well. You doing well today? I am. You went outdoors today. I did. Where'd you go? The um, Kane County Flea Market. Nice. It was a big outing. Did you find anything? No. No. <laughs> no, I was actually like, oh, so this is like a, like, a place like a place to go like it's a uh, they hold it on the fairgrounds it's every like the first weekend of every month from spring to fall and so there's indoor vendors there's outdoor vendors there's everything under the sun new stuff old stuff everything in between it was probably just nice getting outside it was beautiful weather yeah. today sunny just a nice in the day 50s. to be out yeah nice we were kind of excited because we thought oh this is like, this is their first, today was their first day. No, yesterday was their first day, but this is their first weekend uh, since COVID. They have they didn't have, oh, the, for a whole year, all of these vendors wow. had no business. Wow. So I thought, oh my God, they're all going to be out and they're going to have so much inventory because they've probably been collecting all sorts of goods and things. But no, it was kind of a bummer. Kind of a bummer. Eh, of a, that's right. But you should get to there. go out. It was nice. Just fresh air. It was also like... It was 50, not like in this, yeah, 50 degrees yeah. and so, sunny. But at least you got to go out and enjoy yeah. the weather. It was yep. a beautiful day here in Illinois. We watched a movie last night that took me back to when I was 18 years old and I was coming to America too at Eddie Murphy. If you haven't watched it yet, if you haven't seen the first one yet, Coming to America, watch it and then watch two. If you've seen two, if you're as old as we are, I mean, it's a 30-year-old movie. Now part two came out 30 years later. It was awesome. It was pretty awesome. funny. Awesome. I laughed my ass off. Sexual Chocolate's back, baby. He was singing like crazy. So take a look at that movie if you want something good to watch while you're baked, because we were pretty baked last night having a good time. And uh, Mrs. Weeman and I are drinking the champagne of all beers right now. Cheers. A little Miller High Life, because we're high right mm -hmm. now. Champagne of beers. Mm -hmm. And I am going to smoke while Mrs. Weeman does her first talk, but before she does that... She's eating an edible today because we talked about her asthma on the last episode. So she ate an edible, something we make at home called cushy rolls. They taste like a Tootsie Roll. They're absolutely positively fantabulous. But I'm going to talk about the strain we're about to smoke. It's an oldie but a goodie. We've smoked this strain before on the show. Someone gave me a nug, and I wanted to smoke it again. It's called Vanilla Kush. It's a 70% indica dominant, 30% sativa, approximately between like 19 and 20% with 1% CBD. It came from... Um, Overseas, it's a Dutch strain, has THC levels, like I said, around 20%. It's a big, relaxing body high. Uh, we were, we were like, in the couch last night watching that movie, but we were laughing a lot. What's good is give it a little euphoria. There's some happiness. Um, that's what most vanilla kush strains, if you, whoever breeder you get it from. Uh, the strain is good for mental conditions, arthritis. Uh, it tastes and smells like vanilla. With a little sweet lavender notes. This one that we smoked yesterday had a little greeny, like grassy taste to it, though. I don't know if it was cured correctly or not, but it still was good. The high was amazing. I mean, we were we were baked. Uh, also very munchy. Yeah, we had yeah, lots of snacks. Yeah, we had lots of snacks, <laughs> snacks. last night. But um, it descends from the cashmere hash plant in the Afghani Kush. It's uh, real popular here in the States. It's uh, it's I guess it's really easy to cultivate too if you do decide to grow it at home, and it's uh, it's very powerful to newcomers, even though it's very low on the, on the uh, THC, but it 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 whacks it it, it gives it packs a punch. Let's just put it that way. And we were it's a soothing body high, uh, also really good for sleeping because we came back down after the movie and smoked a little more, and we watched uh, some meditation I, show last night. Honestly, and you, you were out. I thought about it today. I'm like, I don't think I even saw two minutes of that show. <laughs> I heard close your eyes, and I did. <laughs> and you did. <laughs> and then it's good for chronic pain, depression, fibromyalgia, insomnia, loss of appetite, migraines. Well, loss of appetite. We had the munchies. Uh, migraines, nausea, PMS, PTSD. Well, it's for a lack of It increases your appetite. Right. That's yeah, what I'm saying. It yeah, it did. Yep. PTSD and stretch, uh, stress. Um, it's got a sweet vanilla taste to it from what they say. Ours was a little greeny, but it was still good. Uh, some aromas are lavender, sweet, citrus, and floral. So I'm going to smoke while Mrs. Weed Man is going to start us off today on today's show because it is uh, Women's History Month, and she's going to take it away with moms talking about cannabis. Yeah. Take I'm, it away, Mrs. Weed Man, yeah. while I smoke. Yeah. Smoke, smoke. I just, I'm going to just have a little side note here on my um, edible. It was a homemade, um, kind of like a brownie bite, essentially. And... 
I presume our pieces are cut into like 20 milligram doses. So I ate a quarter of it about an hour ago. Um, so I just feel a nice mild buzz. And I think those were made with our homemade yeah, coconut our home oil. Yep. That was the Weed Man uh, strain. Yep. Right. So anyway, it's good. Yeah, thanks, nice, Wes. Nice and light. So I'll eat the other three quarters of that before I go to bed. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I yeah. just smoked this and it does, it has, it tastes like cauliflower. Yeah. Unfortunately, because I've had vanilla kush a couple times and I, 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 I've never tasted the vanilla, but I, it, it has some good flavors to it. This one's just very green. Mm-hmm. It's still good. The high was there last night. So I took a nice big rip. We'll see what happens. But Mrs. Wee, man, I'm so excited yep. about this talk because uh, uh, when we were, when I was reading this, this article and, and doing some research with you and talking about this, I really enjoyed it, so I'm super stoked about this about this talk right now. So take it away. Yeah. So this is um, a, an interview of many different women that are in the cannabis industry, and these moms are cannabis moms. They work in the industry. They have children. So they're going to talk about the stigmas, the politics, and working in a male-dominated industry. Um, over the last 11 months, the cannabis industry has begun marketing directly toward a new demographic, moms. Plagued with the stress of parenting during a pandemic, working from home, and a shared sense of community upheaval, many mothers have turned to cannabis for the first time. Though there's been a notable increase in cannabis usage amongst some mothers, many have been using cannabis to manage stress and for enjoyment as long as cannabis has been around. Some, especially in legalized states, are executives in the industry and maybe even own their own brands. Despite the relative success of women in the cannabis industry, legal weed is oftentimes a man's game. Not only does the process of procuring investment tend to favor young white men, but so have representations of stoner culture, which has historically sidelined women through sexist language and, and stereotypes. Yet women have been key to cannabis activism and legalization through the years, and a disproportionate amount of women have founded their own cannabis companies when compared to other industries. Mothers of the industry facing the still present risk of the war on drugs, as well as sexism and judgment from other parents for their chosen career path, have become champions for the plant in their own right. The journalists talked to some of the leading mothers in the cannabis industry today um, about their most interesting stories and what they think needs to change to make this industry more inclusive. Uh, so the first interviewer was Whitney Beatty. She is the CEO at Apothecary Brands. Uh, she was a late bloomer. She grew up in the 80s at the peak of the anti-drug propaganda. She says she could hardly differentiate between hard drugs and plant medicine. That changed when her doctor recommended it was a way to soothe her anxiety disorder. It was only after finding medicinal relief from cannabis that she realized her negative feelings about it were Harry Esslinger's design, just right, the war on drugs. So she didn't even have her own opinion. It was just what she was taught. Slinger. Now she devotes her time to a product that aims to normalize cannabis by creating one of the most stylish and genuinely useful cannabis cases around. Wine moms might keep a bottle of rosé in the fridge. Beatty encourages cannabis consumers to store their products in her custom humidor cases. Nice. Yeah. Uh, Kristen Muir Sloat is the co-owner at Alpin Stash. It's a uh, she. I'm sorry. She's newly open about her weed use or her cannabis usage, and says the transition has been relatively smooth. Running the craft cannabis business grow up at Alpin Stash with her husband, she says she's developed a bit of a reputation amongst other parents. Often other moms who consume reach out to me with questions or looking for a fellow canna mom to hang out with, which I love, she says. However, this conversation usually starts with some declaration of secrecy where they feel uncomfortable about being out of the cannabis closet. Hmm. Uh, Though her son is a toddler now, she talks with her husband often about how they'll explain cannabis to him when he gets older. She says she's already helping... Uh, by growing cannabis alongside other plants in their garden, and her son just views it as any other plant. When it comes to breaching the topic of recreational use, Muir Sloat has no plan to overthink it. We won't glorify or demonize it. We will teach him to understand and respect it. Before you go any further, that's mm-hmm. awesome. I know. that because When I read that, yeah. that's what we've been trying to talk about. She is. We've talked about this in the past about teaching 
kids now about cannabis because it is a medicine, it is legal. This is absolutely awesome yeah. where the mom is teaching her, not not making a big deal about it. Mm -hmm. It's just like a tomato plant. It's just like right. a carrot. It's just like something you're growing in your garden. But you still know because there's still a stigma around it. And by what she's doing, it it is perfect for someone who believes in it, right? But for the people who haven't gotten their mind around cannabis, haven't educated themselves, still read into the whole stigma scene, right? There's going to be, and even beyond the stigma, there's still going to be, be people that don't agree with it just like there's people who don't agree with alcohol um but with that said you're there's going to be children who they're going to have friends whose parents embrace it and they're going to have friends whose parents deny it right. and, and don't agree with it and your kids are going to have friends that have both both things just like alcohol in the household or you know a lot of other things yep there's going to be kids who have it in their home and kids who don't so it's interesting because we're going to see this whole new generation of children grow up with a very cannabis friendly environment yep. right it's gonna be or different i mean it, you see billboards all over in illinois yeah. you drive the freeways and there's yeah, if you drive on 294 it's billboard yeah. city uh, cannabis, but it's cannabis. i wonder how high schools and grammar schools are now going to have to teach it yeah are they going to teach it as a medicine use or are they going to teach it as they do alcohol hey you got to be 21 to use it don't don't do alcohol, don't do cannabis and drive kind of thing. Or are they really going to embrace it and teach it in science classes? Science, 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 yeah. and and history. I don't know that they would ever go that deep into it. It's it's just a subject. I mean, if you think about a science class, they're you, teaching you, it in college. I know, but that's an elective right. course. In high school, they've got prerequisite. The school has mandates on what they have to well, teach. Once it's federally legal, they're going to have to teach it in medicine, though. You know, medicine courses probably. Right. Don't you think? Yes, but in your grade school and high school science class it could be a chapter right. in a book true true and will it be a chapter about it being addictive and bad or will it be a chapter about it being good too soon to hopefully tell, I guess. it'll be good too soon to tell right? too soon to tell <laughs> all right so the next interview was with esther song and she is the new chief marketing officer at candescent a company known for approachable packaging that appeals to new consumers and aficionados alike she says that working with the large and mission-driven brand aligns perfectly with her outlook on life since having a child. Being a new mother has given me a better understanding of what's important in the world, and I believe this industry is shaping the future of consumer and retail experiences, as well as creating a significant social impact, she says. Song's lucky in that she says she's faced relatively little cannabis stigma from her parents. In fact, she says she's noticed a growing trend among new moms reaching for cannabis to alleviate pandemic-related stressors. Over the last few months, she says she's enjoyed using the extra time to get acquainted with cand candescent products along with her husband, quote-unquote, once the baby goes to sleep. <laughs> it's cute. Uh, Chrissy Stone, who is a field rep at Sunderstorm, got started early in the cannabis industry, entering her first dispensary job at just 17 years old in San Diego. That's pretty cool. I mean, there, there are going to be people that, like, go to high school and, well, no, not high school, because you'd probably have to be 18 or older. Well, she started cool. working. She's 17. 17, she started in the industry. Huh. Could be just the laws. Yeah, whatever. Laws are different. Anyway, she got started at 17. Like, her adult working career has just been in cannabis. Yeah. Legally. That's awesome. <laughs> That's cool. She said, my parents hated it. And told me, this is no job for my daughter. Where will it take you in life? She jokes about it now and says confronting that stigma at an early age paid off. Now at 29, she works for what she calls one of the best companies in the cannabis business. That doesn't mean she's totally escaped the judgment, however. Rather, she says she's learned better how to manage perceptions and be proud of her role in a controversial industry. When her five-year-old son was asked to explain what his mom did for work, for example, he blew her cover in front of all of the other parents. <laughs> My son looked at the class and then looked back at me and in his loudest voice said, My mommy sells your mommies and daddy's candy that make them feel funny. <laughs> She says, so good. No other parents had any questions, and they avoided returning to the topic. Um, but instead of lamenting, she just shrugged it off. She said, I brushed it off with a smile and closed it with, if any parents would like some candy, let me know. <laughs> Love it. Her son laughed, and so did she, and that's all that mattered. Um, Amy Ciricione Ceric O'Connor is the co-founder and head of people officer at Humboldt Society. 
Amy's cannabis use has changed a lot over time. An avid recreational consumer in her late teens and 20s, she says getting stoned was key to her identity. Now she mostly microdoses. I use five milligram gummies. I hit, take one hit off of a vape or a joint or like a 0.25 tincture to help me relax at the end of the day, she says. Her cannabis-friendly boutique hotel allows people to visit the cannabis heartland in style and without judgment. That's so cool. Humbled social. Um, she said, living in a region that's home to some of the world's most famous cannabis makers, talking about cannabis is a lot easier than it is for mothers elsewhere in the country. She says she loves working with women farmers, many of whom are also moms. If other moms judge her, she says she pays them no mind. I'm sure there are plenty of people out there who might judge me for what for my use, but I have actually asked them for their have I actually asked them for opinion? No, and I don't plan to. To her, the conversation about normalizing cannabis as a mom must put the politics of cannabis activism front and center. To truly navigate cannabis stigma, we need to have a national reckoning about the trauma, criminalization inflicted upon our communities, especially black and brown and indigenous communities, she argues. So anyway, these are just a few representations of women who are moving the cannabis industry forward. Cannabis moms um, really are just opting for a high over a headache. Um, rather... They are using their talents and their expertise to drive the industry in a more inclusive and welcoming direction. So in years to come, we can only hope that they will be an anomaly. Anomaly. They won't be an anomaly, but rather a norm. Go girls. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Love cool. it. Girl power. That's pretty good. Yeah. You know, it's, it's good to see more and more women leading the way in the industry of cannabis, which we've read that it is a male-dominated industry um, on a few occasions. But reading over these last couple of years, learning, watching more and more women, watching more and more um, minorities get involved in, in cannabis, because it's your culture and your community just as much as it is anybody else. You've been around it longer than anybody else. Women have been using cannabis for a lot of things, hemp, making clothing, you own it, win it. As uh, I don't know if you guys ever seen the movie Step Brothers. Uh, just drop your balls on the brother's drum set and you'll be just fine in life. You'll be just fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think on the note of women too, though, in cannabis, when you think back like um, old stories or fo like archival photos of people growing weed, a lot of times it was a, a, a farm, quote unquote. It wasn't like a... Per, like, a legal farm, so it was a hidden little crop, little right? Gem. And it was a husband and wife, or it was a, a guy, or it was a woman. There were a lot of women out there growing weed yeah. in the middle of the Fields. forest, right? Yeah. And they then they were turning it. I feel like they were a lot of like the medicine women, like they they learned how to bake it and cook with it and share it yeah. and hundred percent and the effects of it. So women have been in it forever. Oh yeah, um, been taking care of business, yeah. business, and now they're running companies. I love it. Pretty cool. I love it. So um, we talk about terpenes a lot on this show. Uh, it is about the terpenes, not just only about cannabinoids. Terpenes play a big role, and it will shape the future of cannabis and the way you look for, for cannabis strains because of the healing prospects that terpenes, and they're finding more and more about. And we've read them all. You can go back and listen to our other episodes or go research them, and I've been putting stuff on our Instagram. But it's fascinating how people choose their cannabis products, especially nowadays with terpenes being pronounced and and the flower and cannabinoids it wasn't long ago though when all you had to do was from your plug was i'll take whatever you got because they don't there was no name there was no thc content they just sold you some weed back when in high school i just knew it was going to get me high socially it was great you know or back even i mean we've been together 26 years did i ever say hey Look at this name strain till maybe about seven, eight years ago, maybe yeah. nine no. years ago. Right. I mean, I knew some names earlier on, and but we you just got what you got, right. right? Yeah. So you take what you get, and then, but now go to today, where it's legally available in many states and markets, and for medical and adult use. And now people are, are focusing on THC hunting, just like I talked about pheno hunting, where you're looking for seeds to to to, to plant. But now THC hunting is going to become – you're going to have your your 
people, your burner stoners and potheads out there that are kind of like craft beer nerds. You're going to have, and they're already out there, your 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 weed nerds, which is great because it's going to keep people coming at you with, with more terpenes and more cannabinoids and giving you a little bit more in each of the strains they grow, and you're going to be searching for that. And it's a common factor for consumers and patients person per, purchasing flour in legal markets is that THC level associated with particular fra- flour rather than terpenes. But now veteran consumers are wanting not only just the strongest THG flour available, but they also are looking for terpenes. Rookies and new, newbies are the opposite, often the case. The problem with this method is that THG testing levels can be misleading. Many producers know that THC levels drive sales, so they will get uh, multiple tests performed and go with whatever test results come back with the greatest amount of THC, even if it's not necessarily accurate. The higher the bud grows, the more on the tip of, of, your, of your node and of your bud and of your colas and your pistols and all that stuff that flower makes up, you the higher it, it, the, the top of the buds are more stronger than the middle and the down because it's getting the best light. It's getting the, the most sh- shot up to it or shot down to it. So you're going to get different results depending on where the bud lands and where they, where, they, where they send it in. So those factors can also be misleading. Like we said, as much more applicable set for criteria is becoming more popular as dispensaries, which is good news for patients and consumers. Terpene profiles, though, cannabis plants contain high concentrations of terpenes. Terpenes are the aromatic compounds found in the plants. Knowing which terpenes are the most prominent in particular, Cannabis sample provides far more insight into the likely effects of the sample compared to THC levels, strain names, and indica sativa designations. It is estimated there are more than 100 terpenes found in cannabis plants, with each having its own distinct characteristics. For example, the terpene linalu has a strong sedative and calming effect. The same can be said for myrcene. It is uh, those particular effects are desirable. Looking for cannabis terpene profiles that are high in linalu and myrcene is much more scientific approach than looking for indica dominant flower that may or may not possess the commonly associated effects. It's all about the effects. I want cannabis that's going to give me the effects. I want to know nowadays what it's going to do because in my younger years smoking cannabis, I'd smoke a strain and sometimes I freak out. Sometimes I'd feel great. Sometimes I want to go out and party. Sometimes I just want to go home and stay on the couch. And sometimes I wouldn't want to even get out of bed. Nowadays, you can look up the effects of that cannabis, and it's great. When I read the strains that we're, we're smoking, I always let you know the effects of it because or and the ailments it could help because that is what cannabis is going to become in the future. You, you could still be a stoner, burner, and pothead and just grab weed because you like getting high. But nowadays, newbies, new people, they're getting into cannabis. They're going to want to know what it does because they could have gotten scared uh, from someone that told them, hey, I smoked weed when I was like 17 and I freaked out and I had to take me to the hospital because I was all freaked out. Well, we've talked about this so many times. You oversmoked. You didn't know what you were smoking. You didn't know what was in it. You got way too high. You ate too much edibles and you got freaked out. So now people are going to be more apt to understanding cannabis and weed because they're going to be able to look up what that strain does. And I think that is fucking awesome. I think it's awesome. I'm so excited to know because and I'm going to, I'm going to go on about this because I, so many times I've smoked stuff and, if, and I got paranoid and I have, but I, you know, now I know why I get paranoid because it's my head trying to work shit out. But sometimes I don't want to think. Sometimes I just want to be like, I want my, my night to end and I just want to go to bed with a clear head. And that's why I, that's the kind of strains I love. I just want to go to bed and not have to think about my next day or what I did that day. Cause my mind goes 50 million miles per hour. Sometimes putting the show on work, thinking about our kids, thinking about Mrs. Weedman and I, sometimes you got to think about, and sometimes you just want to shut it all off. So knowing what the effects are is going to be awesome. Um, my cushy roll just kicked in. Yeah, I'm I I am cold all the time, so I'm currently fully dressed and then wrapped in a blanket while I I sit here and record, and my blanket has tassels on it, and I am rather entertained. I saw you. Well, Mr. Weedman is talking. I watched you by pet them, fixing every tassel so that all of the little <laughs> strings are straight. So um, I think the, these cushy rolls. I was watching you the whole yeah, time. Yeah, you could get your mind off of things. Nice. <laughs> like I am really happy over here. <laughs> oh shit! This is great. Uh, look BD- how straight those are. They Ooh. look pretty. Yeah. BDSA reports global cannabis sales exceeded 21 billion in 2020. Global 
21 billion and forecast 55.9 billion globally by 2026. BDSA is a reporting site that you can uh, that companies pay to get information and stuff like that. So uh, that's pretty great. That's good for sales. I mean, that's just going to keep on growing. And just uh, here's something cool about Illinois. Uh, we did $80 million in February, down, though, from January, $8 million overall, $57 million, uh, almost $58 million in in-state, and almost $23 million out-of-state. Here's why we were down. February is a shorter month. Shorter month. You lose two selling days. Actually, yeah, you, yeah, you lose uh, two selling days, one or two selling days, depending on the month. And also, uh, the snow, the weather for February Sucked, but we're only down eight million for the kind of weather we had. What was the total? Uh, eighty million. Wow, almost for one month. Million. Yeah, one month. Shit. That is uh, an increase. <laughs> uh, last February in twenty twenty, they did thirty four million eight hundred and five. So you're, you, that mm. increases. You're you're at a fifty, almost a fifty million, uh, forty eight million dollar, forty six million dollar increase. Sorry, <laughs> what is it? Sorry, forty six million dollar <laughs> increase. Sorry. Yeah. But that's huge. That I mean, you you you're. You, the sales are huge. Yeah. Just because we were down eight million, February s- sucks. People are broke. They're paying their credit card. Four days out of business. Yeah, like, yeah. And plus, whatever. it snowed. You know, we had that that three or four days of just crazy snow. But still proud of Illinois. Keep on smoking that weed, yo. Uh, Governor Tom Wolf signs three hundred ten pardons, including sixty nine violent cr- violent marijuana. Oh, they put marijuana in here. Cannabis related offenses. Um, Governor Tom Wolf Monday announced that he signed 310 pardons, including 69 that were part of the expedited review program for nonviolent cannabis-related offenses. These pardons will give 310 people a chance to put the conviction behind them, offering them more opportunities as they build their careers, buy homes, and move on their way, to, uh, move their lives free of this burden. Uh, we've talked about this on uh, reform, and we've talked about these guys are pardoned. So they have no record. So they can go about and live their lives. And I think we need to do that for a lot of nonviolent cannabis acts so these people can go back and have a life. Um, so good for you, uh, Pennsylvania. And Tom, appreciate you. Thanks, Tom. Yeah. Mississippi House replaced the Senate alternate m- medical cannabis program with, with what voters originally pr- approved. Thank you, Mississippi. A House panel on Tuesday gutted the Senate medical cannabis proposal and inserted the medical cannabis language voters passed on the constitutional amendment back in November. That's what I've been saying. Go by what the people wanted and what was in the bill originally. Don't change it. You fuck it up that way. (laughs) So, good job, Mississippi. Love it. Uh, Iowa Senator approves bill to reduce cannabis penalties. You just need to legalize it, though. Something in Iowa. Iowans arrested for possession of small amounts of cannabis would face less severe penalties under a bill proposed in Iowa Senate. Senate Study Bill 1226 would make possession of under 5 grams of cannabis a simple misdemeanor for a first offense. 5 grams? Come on. Ugh, you should make it an ounce. That would mean a maximum pun- a punishment of 30 days in jail and a fine of between 65 and 625 bucks. Okay, it's a little bit better, but you should just decriminalize it, at least, all of it. Uh, The Massachusetts cannabis industry is a billion-dollar marketplace. Billion. Another state. Another state doing a billion dollars in cannabis sales. Crazy. Um, Good for you, Mass. Appreciate you. Uh, Tennessee senators approved medical cannabis bill in in committee. Good for you, Tennessee. A bill that legalized medical cannabis in Tennessee cleared Senate committee on Wednesday with the panel rejected a separate proposal that would have simple required regulators to study the prospect of eventually enacting the reform and the federal law changed. The legislation sponsored by Senator Janice Bowling was approved by Senate Government Operations Committee in a 6-2 to vote and has now been advanced to the Judiciary Committee for consideration. It would allow patients with qualifying conditions to possess and purchase cannabis from the licensed dispensaries. However, cannabis products couldn't be for smoking or vaping, nor could they be used into food items. A medical cannabis commission would be established to issue licenses to set uh, out regulations for the program. So you can only probably just get flour for now. So that's a start. We would not be making criminals out of people who would help with their health treatment and they want to be addicted to opioids, Bowling said, adding that she felt the coronavirus pandemic demonstrated a need to legalize cannabis for therapeutic use. Good for you. That's great. Good stuff there, Tennessee. I like Tennessee. Tennessee. Uh, Oklahoma medical cannabis sales surpassed $800 million for 2020, almost another state at a billion dollars. Hmm. They're going to have 2,000 dispensaries probably in the next five years in Oklahoma, maybe even sooner. Uh, the number of residents registered to purchase medical cannabis reached 365,000 in December, up from 20, 222,000 in January of 2020. That is just crazy Oklahoma, man. Just smoking. Love it. See those clouds? 
big clouds all the way here in Chicago. Uh, some Vermont towns and uh, uh, will allow cannabis retail. Nearly two do- dozen towns and other jurisdictions in Vermont have approved adult-use cannabis retail operations in recent town meetings. More than 20 Vermont communities have approved adult-use cannabis operations in recent town meetings, according to the Associated Press. Vermont is taking a local approach to rolling out the adult-use cannabis system. Instead of outright legalization across the state, voters can approve the adult-use industry on a town-by-town basis. Once a town votes in favor, businesses can apply for retail licenses, which are then considered by state board. I think that's awesome. It is. Like the town, you know, a town could just say, hey, don't even let the states handle it. Because we've seen in some states, especially the one we live in, kind of screwed up a little bit. If the township wants it. And Every then, town can have their own rules. Yeah, but could you imagine governing all that? Why? Every town has a mayor. We Every town live has a city council. With Right. We live with very close communities that are different zip codes right. and different mayors and different towns. Like, could you imagine if you went to a neighboring town and bought something and came back home? Now your your laws are different and you're own home yeah maybe just like going state to state i just right. think it would make if the it really state would complex. just legalize it right. and just say hey cannabis is legal yeah now you have to decide if you want it in your township or not and we just want our tax dollars i don't know i think, I don't it'd, know. I'd I'd think maybe messy. maybe a, t- a, a, a state like vermont which is small yeah then illinois or or california or florida could possibly do this not as many counties not as many municipalities not as many right. mayors i think it would, i think it's cool I like it. I like the idea. Good for you, Vermont. Go for Vermont. Um, <laughs> the one thing cool about hemp, it can be used for a bunch of different products. And hemp is, it, when uh, we didn't hit Plymouth Rock, Plymouth Rock hit us when uh, the pilgrims came over here. And then when uh, when the United States happened, you had to come over here and sign contracts to be able to grow your own hemp. And, and actually, they, the government paid you to grow hemp, and they wanted you to grow hemp. Hemp was used here in, 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 in the United States and around the world for hundreds and hundreds and thousands and thousands of years. And now it's finally coming back. Now, we've used some, some hemp products, mm-hmm. you know, over the years. You know, when, it, when we saw it, we were able to start getting it. Like, uh, um, but there's, there's some products out there that can be made from hemp, and there's some real important products. Mm-hmm. Right, Mrs. Weedman? Yep. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to talk about some of that. So we talk about this quite a bit, the different the difference between hemp and cannabis. It's the same plant. Uh, hemp is considered a uh, plant that has less than 0.3% THC. That's the laws here. Is that a technical that allowance, the, too? That is like, that's the, across the that board? Is, yeah, from the, farm, the, the Cannabis Act that came out. Okay. Yep, and, uh, so over 0.3% THC then you are dealing with a THC product, which would be cannabis. And then you need, you know, legalization or medicinal cards, right? Um, So anyway, hemp can be grown now uh, since the Farm Act was changed, and we are back to allowing hemp to be grown in the U.S. It's turning it little by little. It's going to become industrialized here, I'm sure. Um, And there's just gazillions of products that can be made. It just seems like the possibilities are endless. What's a gazillion? A lot. A lot? Okay. <laughs> I don't know how many zeros. I don't even know if it's actually real. Is a gazillion real? I oh. don't know. <laughs> I think it's just a, that's just, yeah, just me talking. Anyway, tons and tons of possibilities, right? So hemp can't get you high, but it can do just about anything else. Uh, this is a low THC variant of the cannabis plant, and it has a dizzying array of uses. So we're going to talk about 15 of them. Uh, last week, I actually brought up beer, craft beer in relation to hemp and how similar they are. So beer is one way that hemp can be used because hops and cannabis are essentially botanical cousins. There are now a handful of breweries around the country that use hemp to make cannabis infused beer. Of course, the beer won't be psychoactive, but the hemp does give it an interesting weedy flavor. So if you've had like a hop heavy beer, I've tried two hemp made yeah. beers. Yeah. yeah. They are very so, weedy. Just very hoppy, yeah. right? Sunscreen. They're finding that hemp uh, can be used to make highly effective sunscreen. The plant isn't actually blocking UV rays, but it works great as a base for zinc oxide, which does block the sun. On top of that, hemp is good for your skin, adding a little extra benefit to using a hemp-based sunscreen. 
uh, milk. Hemp seeds are incredibly nutritious, and they can be used to make hemp milk, hemp milk, which you'll see, like I've seen that in the store, hemp milk, almond milk, coconut milk, soy milk. Yeah, uh, it's a great option for those who don't respond well to dairy and for anyone looking to go green with their diet. Shoes. All sorts of companies are using hemp textiles to make shoes. They look similar to canvas. One of the more famous pairs of hemp shoes was Nike's Special 420 release back in 16, which featured a hemp body and sleek accents. I would like to see those. Yeah. Uh, fifth would be rope. This is one of the most classic uses of the hemp plant. In fact, humans have been using hemp fibers for more than 10,000 years, and rope was one of the first products humans made out of hemp. Did you know that George Washington and Thomas Jefferson grew acres of hemp? I knew that. Well, I didn't. Um, clothes or textiles. So similar to rope, humans have been using the fibrous parts of the hemp plant to make a huge variety of textiles for thousands of years. In particular, hemp can be used to make fabric, which can then be turned into any piece of clothing imaginable. Uh, soap. Hemp is an excellent base for soap making because it primarily has high levels of fatty substances that are needed to make high quality soap. Hempcrete. This is a new one to me. Do they put rope on that soap? Soap on a rope. Hey, you could have a double whammy. Make sure you don't drop it. Hempy, hempy. <laughs> don't drop your soap. Keep it on a rope. That's it. <laughs> hemp rope, hemp soap, baby. Hempcrete. Is, uh, I've never heard of that. No, but you know, okay, so let me explain first. Industrial hemp can be processed into a product called hempcrete. This building material is strong, durable, and an excellent insulator. All of this adds up to an incredibly sustainable and effective way to construct homes and other buildings. Think about adobe construction. Yeah. That's mud and, and like hay. Yeah. Kind of the same. Yeah, right? that'd be and awesome. Adobe homes can last as long as a brick home, yep. if not longer. So, kind of cool. I wonder if that would, like, I don't know. We'll have to see. Maybe they'll start making bricks out of hemp. That'd be cool. Uh, a hemp sports car. I was That's like, what? awesome. That's cool. So, Renew, it's called the Renew Sports Car, and it has been in the headlines over the past couple of years because it features a body made out of hemp. The company's design uses hemp fibers that have been tightly interwoven and then covered over with a super hard resin, so like fiberglass. I wouldn't know. I didn't know that hemp would be strong enough like that, though. Uh, the car jumped into the spotlight last year when Jay Leno drove it on his show, Jay's or Jay Leno's Garage. Uh, paper. That's kind of an obvious, right? Paper is typically made out of wood pulp, but it can be also be made out of hemp fibers. In fact, a lot of ways it makes much more sense to make paper out of hemp because it can grow significantly faster. Uh, yeah, we need to save our trees. Tree. We do need to save our trees. We used and to I, I had read that there was a, uh, and I didn't. T I'm not gonna really talk about much of it, but I read there was a big, in the United States in 2020 was the biggest year of hemp waste. They didn't use all of it that they grew. Oh, uh, well, because it's a newer, they, people have to become but there was familiar like with it. Right? So much acreage of waste. I saw the picture. Yeah. I almost, I threw up in my mouth. I was like, oh my goodness. So all they this. are growing more than anybody's re right. requiring. Because we have no manufacturing in the United right. States for hemp right now like the, you know how many jobs that can handle and you know how much we can right. do with that go ahead finish up and we'll talk okay. more okay protein powder this has been around for some time uh many people consider hemp seeds to be superfoods. we use them in our shakes yeah. protein shakes um, gotta add a lot of fruit though yeah, yeah they, they taste like <laughs> dirt yeah. yeah uh and they are yeah it really tastes like dirt it's good makes They're, you strong yeah. like bull but mm -hmm. yeah i need a uh, need a lot of fruit um, hemp seeds are full of fatty acids, tons of protein, loads of antioxidants, amino acids, and other critical nutrients. Because of this, hemp seeds are used in a wide range of foods and drinks, and may, many people eat them just on their own. Yeah, I don't think I would. One popular hemp food product is hemp protein powder, which gives people a boost of plant-based protein that is greener and more sustainable than many other types of protein powder, which typically use dairy products. Um, diapers. So hemp fibers can be used to make the cloth for uh, cloth diapers. Um, they can actually be more absorbent than cotton. They're saying that hemp could be more absorbent. In some ways, cloth diapers are more eco-friendly than disposable ones. Um, in some ways, they're not because really uh, you have to use a lot of water and resources to clean them. So there's a lot of controversy over how much you're actually saving. 
Um, you ever think how but many landfills aren't? Getting that's what filled, I'm saying. Right? You ever think how many diapers, diapers are, are being landfill? thrown away? Oh my god! Do every you think year? about the freaking plastic bags at the grocery store? They lately, I don't know about stores elsewhere in the world, but holy cow! You go to the grocery store if you buy 20 items, you come out with 10 bags. I'm like, could you put every? Yes, for paper. A lot and then they too, want to double bag everything. Yeah, I'm like, you put one bag. item in the bag. Give me a break. Like, put 30 in there. Dirty, Fill it up. Nothing worse than a dirty diaper. Because you can't diaper. bring your reusable bags. Yeah, I know. It's terrible. Dirty diapers and plastic bags are going to be, like, the death of, like, <sighs> oof, the landfills are just, just like, gross. bogged. It's so, so bad. So, anyway, you can buy hemp fiber, uh, hemp fabric uh, reusable diapers. That's pretty cool. Uh, fuel. Hemp can be processed into a hemp biodiesel and hemp ethanol and methanol, both of which can be used as fuel. In fact, hemp-based fuels are supposed to be significantly more eco-friendly and cost-efficient than petroleum fuels. And here's the big one, super capacitors, everybody. So, you know, the big unit that houses all of the electricity and, and energy that goes into, like, a big commercial building? Well, for the last several years, researchers have been working on building super capacitors that can store energy way more efficiently and cleanly than current energy sources. So far, the best supercapacitors are made out of graphene nano sheets, which are too expensive to be commercial, commercially viable. But back in 2014, a group of Canadian scientists figured out how to make nano sheets out of hemp fibers, which can then be used to make supercapacitors. The key advantage is that the electrodes are made from bio waste nice. using a simple process and therefore are much cheaper than graphene. Interesting, a little technical. Uh, CBD oil, of course, we know hemp, CBD, right? Hand in hand. Um, but industrial hemp can be used to make medicinal grade CBD oil. I did not know that. I thought there'd be a difference between industrial hemp and like what you'd grow for CBD. But in fact, making CBD oil out of hemp is currently one of the safest, safest, most effective ways to produce and distribute the product. That's because hemp makes it much easier for cannabis products to circumvent federal prohibition laws. Industrial hemp plants don't have enough THC to be considered illegal under federal law, but they have plenty of the powerful cannabinoids. In particular, hemp plants produce CBD the chemical responsible for many of the cannabis plant's medicinal properties. Beyond legal concerns, hemp CBD oil is also a great choice for patients who want the medicinal benefits of cannabis without any of the psychoactive effects of THC. So, clearly, hemp is a do-it-all kind of plant, from textiles to superfoods to building materials to medicine. Hemp can do just about anything you can imagine, uh, except to get you high. That's good. Cool. Yeah. I, I, I mean, the milk thing, you know how I feel about cow's milk. You know, yeah. if you ever want to talk about milk from another animal, talk to Mr. <laughs> Weed Man. I'll give you my thoughts on he has, it. He has a very strong opinion. Very strong that. opinion about us taking milk from other animals. We won't go into it on this episode. Talk about it another time. Uh, but that's great. <laughs> I, but I, uh, you, you like cheese. I do. I love cheese. Yeah, but we could have... Yeah. I like ice cream. I know, but just drinking milk. Do you like nut cheese? <laughs> <laughs> that sounds awful. But no, like I couldn't no, go I couldn't go gross. vegan and have, um, you remember I'm when sorry. I went dairy free for a, a whole year? Yeah, I don't know how you I went, just avoided cheese altogether. And you bought you and that's my biggest weakness is cheese. I love cheese. I, I can never I, I when I went out for a year and you bought me that almond cheese. Ugh. And you came home like I'll give it a try. But. I mean, I, I, I'm dying for some cheese. And I was like, like, put it in my mouth that I started chewing on. And I just started spitting it out. <laughs> I, was like, blah, blah, blah. I was like, oh, God, awful. I feel bad. I, I don't mean to make fun of it. It's just not my thing. Yeah, I know. There's, there's I know there's people, people out there that adapted like it. Adapted and they yes, like it. And they they enjoy like it. it but they I can't just do it. love, I love cheese. So, uh, so how do we get on the topic of cheese? Milk. Oh, milk. milk. Cow milk. Cow milk. And what was that? We don't need to go through it anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I have a very, very big opinion about that. Sorry, all. Um, all right. International news. Uh, Mexican lawmakers circulate a men cannabis legalization bill that's set for a vote this week. Pretty dope. They are going to be the biggest probably producers 
sales. They're going to say, I mean, they're saying Mexico is going to like be crushing it. They're going to import it. I mean, uh, they're going to import it and export it and Will do that everything about it. Will be the first time it. that they import it? They might they've have. always been uh, exporters. I, I, I'm, I'm sure they'll import some because yeah. they're going to want to try yeah. other people's yeah. strains and stuff like that. But I mean, they're going to export so much of it because they're going to, they've been growing it for so long. They know how to do it. Yeah. I mean, good. You know what? Good for you, Mexico. Mm-hmm. Good for you because of what uh, let's just say what the United States did to you when you came over the border back in the 1800s, and we're in, and uh, they, it was very, very racism was all involved in it. That's why what happened in the 1930s with Harry Aslinger, and they it was all racist. So good for you. I hope you, I hope you just crush it. I hope you guys do 50 billion dollars a year for your own country, and they're gonna pull it away from cartels because they they want the people of the country to make money nice. on it. Yeah, I think it's great. Good for you. Uh, one third of Canadian cannabis users consumed more during the pandemic, uh, due to stress, boredom, loneliness, convenience, ease of access, worsening of health pain, new products such as edibles, concentrates, vape pens, and cartridges. And, uh, just for the fuck of it, it says, (laughs) just for the fuck of it. Um, significantly more than one third of Canadians who use cannabis increased their consumption during covid According to these statistics, the report offers new insights into why Canadian cannabis users might have increased their cannabis use during the public health crisis. 16% of Canadians reported using cannabis at least once in the previous month, according to the study, which has been based uh, uh, from January of 2021. There was a web panel that was done for, for, uh, for uh, Canadian research. So 34% of those who had previously used cannabis said they increased their consumption during the pandemic compared to with 12% reported using less cannabis. More than half of of cannabis users, 54%, said they had uh, not increased their consumption during the pandemic. Stress, boredom, and loneliness were the three top reasons why. Uh, Increased social acceptance of cannabis and the increased number of outlets and range of products available were among the factors to have led to increased consumptions over the past year, according to statistics uh, uh, in Canada. Good for you guys. It's crazy because their their cannabis, they're much how much they're growing up there. They're exporting a shit ton of it. And then you got Mexico about to fully legalize it, and they're going to export it. And here's here's us in the middle going, what do we do now, George? What do we do now? <laughs> we don't know. <laughs> Come on. We're going to be left in the dust. Well, it's, it's on us. So I'm just going to keep on growing my own shit. New Zealand medical cannabis imports out of control. The New Zealand Medical Cannabis Council claims the uh, country's government scheme is being undermined by unregulated medical cannabis imports. Uh, New Zealand MCC says some medical uh, practitioners are importing uh, products and selling directly to patients. They're your plug. Take advantage of the loophole in Section 25 of the NZ's Medicine Act. Uh, the section provided an exemption allowing all authorized prescribers to procure the supply of any cannabis, including approved and unapproved medicines. Among other things, it allows an authorized prescriber to obtain medicine by direct importation. Wow. So, New Zealand, man, there's a way to do it. Under the New Zealand Medical uh, Medicinal Cannabis Scheme, it says here, Compliance requirements and the cost of the results of pharmaceutical-grade GMP manufacturing are putting local producers at a disadvantage. NZMCC says it makes local and legal prescribed products more accessible. Accidental compensation corporation or work and income in New Zealand could automatically approve funding to subside medicines. Let's go, New Zealand. Man, I want to come visit your country and smoke some weed there, so let's do it. Um, first medical cannabis production license issued in Malta. Man. Uh, Canadian company Alfreya will be manufacturing. Uh, look at it. Canadian company will be manufacturing, packaging, and testing products in the form of dried flour in Malta. The Medicines Authority has issued the first license for the production of medical cannabis. The Canadian company Alfreya, a global leader in this sector, global leader, will be manufacturing, packaging, and testing products in the form of dried flour. The dried flowers will be cultivated in Canada. The licensed government said, uh, said it is an important milestone to lead to exportation of medicinal cannabis products from Malta. Government said the direct foreign investment was made possible after a rigorous due diligence process headed by the Medicines Authority in Malta Enterprises. Good for you, Malta. That's just south of, of Sicily. South of the boot. Um, so, international news. It's amazing what other countries are going to be doing and doing with cannabis. So good. Make that money. Support your country. Help people out with it. Use that money wisely. The tax dollars. Help people start their own businesses. Do it right. Um, You know what saddens me? Uh, When I watch some of these uh, animal shows that I love and 
you see plastic everywhere mm -hmm. on the beaches, in the water, uh, on landfills. I mean, everywhere. I mean, I was, I drove out today and I was in a parking lot and there was plastic bottles and Dunkin' Donuts styrofoam. Well, they don't use styrofoam anymore, but Dunkin' Donuts paper cups on the ground. It just all over. We, wa we watched that show, The History of, of Products or the World or something like that on, on Netflix or something like that. I forgot the name of it. But they went in on a whole thing about how plastic was made, how it's ruining the earth. And I mean, I know a lot of us know this and have heard this, but it is bad. And water bottles and the yin-yang. I mean, it's just nuts. And now that cannabis is legal, there there is a lot of cannabis packaging. Right, Mrs. Weeman, mm -hmm. would you say? There's a lot of over-packaging. Over-packaging. I think that's almost the bigger problem. There's over-packaging and over-purchasing. Um, I think in our household, I wouldn't by any means call us minimalists. Um, we definitely have beyond the things that we need, but we are very conscious of our waste. And it does really stress me, like the amount of waste that leaves a house in a day or that your life leaves behind in a day, you know, also referred to as your carbon footprint, right? The amount of waste is you just, if you let your mind expand upon that and think about you times, you know, billions of people, there's a lot of garbage and there's a lot of people who just buy in surplus and just have like no thought in their mind when they just throw away and throw away and throw away, right? And kind of one of our big things that we found when we started getting into when uh, medical cannabis came into Illinois and we started going to the dispensaries and you're buying an item and it's like wrapped and double wrapped and triple wrapped. It took like three wrappers to get into the actual yeah, like right. one bud. One bud is in like two ounces of packaging. And it's like, what is going to happen? And it's beautiful packaging, heavy, heavy plastics, glass, all of these things. Right. So it's a major a major issue like in many many fields of of products in the world like there's just an overabundance of plastics especially and the bigger thing about plastics is that they don't break down they don't disintegrate they don't go away they just stick around so um really it's not just turtles and fish that we need to worry about humans are now breathing in microplastics from all types of packaging this is crazy right According to lead researchers at the Utah State University study, microplastics are turning into dust and are contaminated with toxic chemicals, plastic fragments, and metals. These contaminants are in 4% of the air that we breathe. The cannabis industry's interest in population awareness is escalating rapidly. Both the consumer-level cannabis communities and the cannabis industry must begin to continue investing in eco-friendlier habits as an estimated 150 million tons of cannabis waste is being produced. Say that again. 150 tons of cannabis waste. That's just packaging. So that's just one item. That's not even a, a household item across the board. So think about, like batteries think about milk think about you know boxes of cereal all of the garbage of all of the products that are like in so many homes right just ugh, amplified so here's one industry <clears throat> estimating 150 million pounds or tons, tons. of cannabis waste uh, so the importance of sustainable packaging solutions has never been greater and the cannabis industry is becoming a bigger part of our living planet Plastic components are often seen in cannabis packaging. It's what consumers are surrounded by when walking into the dispensary. The Medical and Adult Use Cannabis Regulation and Safety Act mandates packaging to be child-resistant, tamper-evident, and resealable, which is what leads to all of this over-packaging. There are false claims circulating that the laws require a significant amount of single-use plastic waste to be produced. In response to that claim, Michael Salemi, founder of the packaging company, says it's simply not true. He explained that established, innovative manufacturers have had no issue engineering alternative, sustainable packaging. The large amount of plastics used in the industry are from cannabis companies who have simply chosen to use faster, cheaper packaging solutions. But i got to chime in there, though, too, because product is overpackaged and costs have to involve that right like you're you're paying for that packaging just you're not like, just well, paying just look at a bag of chips or a box right. of cereal the box is huge mm -hmm. but 
the inside it, you only get so much cereal, right. but they make the boxes look bigger. So, That's so you marketing. think you're getting right. But instead of just being realistic and just saying, "Hey, the, it, it's four ounces of cereal," you're gonna get a four ounce box. Right. And then we're using less packaging. Mm-hmm. I mean, if we're still using right. packaging, but go ahead. Right. But it, yeah. So yes, there could be simpler ways. But they're saying there's like all these steps and things you have to keep children from getting in at tamper evident, you know, all these things. Um, but the packaging company, that's actually a company's name, um, they're a packaging provider, and they have the ability to provide their customers the opportunity to go 100% eco-friendly with their raw materials and inserts. But again, that goes back to cost. So you know, yes, the they're saying here that the, the large um, companies are just choosing, they're not opting for those, but it comes down to cost. I mean, you have to like draw a line somewhere on how much you're going to spend to package like one little bud of weed. You're not going to spend, the bud might cost them a buck to produce, and they're going to spend $3 to package it. I have an to idea. To get it out the door for 30 I have bucks. an idea, but I'm waiting until you're done. Yeah. There's, a, there's, yes. So the packaging company is saying, we have the product. They're just opting not to use it. Um, they went on to say that bioplastics, uh, this is data from this uh, study at this, the University of Utah. Bioplastics are not biodegradable packaging. They're compostable, big difference, and they are not the ultimate sustainable solution as an alternative plastic, but it is still an eco-friendlier solution. For example, PLA, which is polyactic acid thermoplastic, is a bioplastic bioplast- often made of plant-based polymers such as hemp, cornstarch, sugarcane, and cassava. So sounds harmless, right? Sounds like it, that'll... that'll Sounds like I want to eat it. Yeah, right? Um, But it's also also often falsely advertised as being biodegradable. It is not biodegradable. It is compostable, but it's only compostable through specialized industrial-grade composters. And that's after being properly routed there, so like through your recycling service, right? And then that recycling service probably has to have this special composter. Um, So if the consumer doesn't take the extra step to toss away their packaging properly, it's guaranteed to spend the rest of its life in a landfill. On the positive side, with proper awareness for consumers and attraction from sellers, bioplastics are a great sustainable alternative. According to a 2017 study on greenhouse gas mitigation on plastics, corn-based bioplastics can reduce industry-wide GHG emissions by 25% greenhouse gas right so it can be reduced by 25 percent. that's huge uh this proves that being green does take a collective effort throughout the whole cycle from the conception of the cannabis plant to the engineering efforts of the packaging providers and finally to which bin the consumer will throw away their finished packaging mendocino farmlands was established in 2017 in the heart of mendocino county by ian powell a 25 year old cannabis cultivating veteran Uh, They're a leader in large-scale production of premium sun-grown organic cannabis, and they're setting an example for the cannabis industry in sustainable operations. Mendocino farmlands are in the business of providing starters and clones to surrounding growers, wholesale flowers to white-label companies, and now they're hitting the shelves with their own pre-rolls, flour, resin, and extracts. The packaging for their products is made up of glass, recyclable materials, and recycled ocean plastics. Adam Donahue, the marketing vice president of Mendocino Farmlands, explained that sustainability is a key decision when selecting their packaging partners. We have always made decisions to reduce our overall carbon footprint. Our primary source of energy for our whole operation is from our installed solar panels. Donahue noted that being sustainable is just part of what they already do. Being mindful of the environment, that provides us with our goods. With both the intention I'm sorry, with both the initiation of companies who started their operations mindful of the carbon footprint and the efforts of sustainability advocates, there is potential to develop highly sustainable practice standards that will lead the way for a carbon neutral industry. That's cool. cool. Yeah. So carbon neutral just is essentially saying you aren't an over consumer and you're not an over waster. You, you produce the energy like your factory produces the energy that it needs to operate it itself. And you're not, uh, you know, exuding more toxins into the air than what you're bringing in. You're, you're sending clean air, air back out and 
you're not affecting essentially you're not you're giving zero effect on the environment so pretty well, cool let's hope we can as a cannabis community and as cannabis grows bigger and bigger because it is yeah. globally not just in the United States globally that we have to do something about the plastics mm -hmm. and I had an idea and I forgot it because I'm really oh, baked shoot. it's all right that's okay. They have good ideas, so I don't, you know. So. <laughs> we can call them tomorrow yeah. and give them your idea. Yeah. <laughs> no, my idea was just this. Uh, it just a lot of a lot of states let you just keep your cannabis in big glass jars, mm -hmm. and you can go and you could pick out your cannabis, right? From right. and they and you put bring it, your jar in or a, you, yeah, that's a little it. paper bag. And that's and a, no paper bag, glass jars, and you 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 can buy them there, mm -hmm. and you, you, if depending on how much you could buy, but. Everything should be put in where you have to bring your own in, and then there's no waste. Right. That was kind of my idea. I don't know if it'll work or not, but, you know, glass, you bring in your glass, your own glass jar up to 2.5 ounces, and you fill it, you take it home. Well, so much of the packaging could be reused. That too. But it, and, and when yeah. I was in, when I was in uh, uh, Oregon, uh, when I was in Portland at Electric Lettuce, they had a returnable, like uh, a big bin where you could bring your your plastics, your That's cool. and you dump them there and they probably reused them or mm -hmm. whatever, which I thought was great. So, but there's I know they so talk about like part of the problems with uh, recycling um, is the cost of the cleaning. So if they brought those bottles back in and then wanted to resource them back out to the manufacturers, they have to be clean, they have to be sanitized, right. they have to be delabeled and, and then go back through production again. So, you know, and get back to... So it's a whole process. I don't know. I'm helping the know. environment out, though, a little bit, because I'm just growing yeah. my own. So, yeah, <laughs> But I also think everybody making the effort to recycle properly, be conscious of the packaging that you're buying, make a comment to the companies when they are overpackaged or not using good plastics, write a little note. I saw a commercial them. one time where there was a, uh, they were talking about um, using reusable products and or... Um, the way this company made their product, and I don't remember the name of it. It was like the real big on the soda. Remember the old plastic soda rings? Mm -hmm. Well, they made ones where because they would always end up in the ocean, and they made one where like fish and turtles can eat it. Oh, I thought that was pretty cool. That is cool. Was it so, made of soy or something? I, yeah. Something I don't know, but they were devouring it. Hmm. I thought it was pretty cool. Hmm. Stuff like that that can help the environment because what we learned was pl plastic takes thousands of years to to to. Uh, Biodegrade. biodegrade. I don't think it actually does biodegrade. Some of it doesn't. So, I don't know. Well, hopefully they can figure this out because there's going to be a lot more cannabis being sold in this world. Yeah. So, hopefully we can, as a can cannabis community, someone can figure this out. They can, maybe they can make cannabis packaging out of hemp. Huh. Yeah. Like a little I mean, envelope. Like little... Something. Little packages. Yeah. Little bags. I mean, when we had the Wall of Fame going and we finally, got, we finally recycled all those, we had a lot of... Eight uh, eighths packaging, yeah, in, in in the basement along the wall here. Glass, and plastic, a lot of metal, plastic though. A lot of about plastic. eighty percent of it was plastic. Yeah, and it was like we, Polly, Dob Boy, Tyler, Shoddy, and Mrs. Weema, we'd always talk about going. Look at all this plastic. It was nuts. So hopefully we need to can't be all about just profits because eventually we ain't gonna be able to take care of this this Mother Earth of ours. So that gave us the plant. Never forget that. Um. I'm all big about somewhat eating healthy. I try <laughs> my best. I'm super big, kind of, maybe, yeah, sort of. Well, sort of. Some days. I eat well five <laughs> days a week, and then two days a week I have fun. Put it that way. But I'm always keeping track of my gut health, my bacteria, my good. You have good midichlorians, and you have bad midichlorians, bacteria. And they like to fight it out in your gut, in your, in your intestines. And I've always, since I've learned and studied... Taoism and studied different uh, cultures and how they took care of their bodies and what they did to keep themselves healthy. It all had a lot of it had to do with with gut health, uh, digestion, and all that good stuff. So um, I'm real big. I, I went and got some work done on my teeth a couple weeks ago, and I had to get uh, some just nothing big. But he wanted a. It was he had to go into my gum, so he's like, "Oh, I'm gonna uh, give you some uh, antibiotics." I'm like, "No, thank you." I said. Uh, my gut health is really on point right now, and if I take an antibiotic, my gut health is going to be wiped. You're going to kill everything, <laughs> and it's going to take me at least three to four months to get it back to where it's going. 
I mean, my digestion tract because my all right is good right now. Good. That's all I'm saying. Good. That's good. So take care of that gut, and it'll take care of you. But in the past few years, scientists have been paying close attention to the so-called gut-brain axis, leading to new understanding on how your gut bacteria influences our moods, cognitive, cognitive, cognitive. <laughs> and mental health, I butchered that, sorry. According to the latest research, cannabinoids play a key role in meditating these effects, indicating that some of the damage caused by harmful microbes in our intestines can in fact be reversed by some of the compounds found in cannabis. Cannabinoids and the gut-brain axis. Only recently have researchers uh, come to appreciate the control of the gut microbiome exerts over the central nervous system and vice versa. Indeed, while the brain is able to send chemical messages to the gut in order to regulate appetite and digestion, an increasing body of research suggests that bacteria therein also release met metobilates that travel in the opposite direction in order to alter brain function. As such, is now widely accepted and make up the person's microbe significantly contributes to the risk of mental health con uh, uh, conditions such as depression. The latest evidence for the leak can be found in the new study in the Journal of Nature Communications, which suggests that certain harmful gut bacteria suppresses the production of cannabinoids in the brain, leading to negative mental health outcomes. The study authors began by studying mice. Man, those mice got it good. That hmm. suffered from an animal uh, animal model of depression when gut bacteria form these uh, from these rodents was transplanted into the intestines of healthy mice. These recipients quickly began to display symptoms similar to those seen in donors, including depression behaviors. Upon further analysis, the research noted that the levels of uh, the endocannabinoid system, called the 2-AG, plummeted in the uh, hippocampus of a healthy mouse that received these uh, depressions-associated gut bacteria. The, uh, this, in turn, caused a sudden decrease in uh, neurogenesis within the hippocampus, meaning that the mice lost the ability to form new neurons in the key part of the brain that controls memory and learning. However, when the study authors injected 2-AG into the brains of these mice, hippocampal neurogenesis was restored and depressive behaviors were alleviated. Similar transplanting health gut bacteria into rodents suffering from depression sparked an increase in the 2-AG levels, leading to an enhanced neurogenesis of reduction in symptoms. Interestingly, the 2-AG binds to some of uh, same receptors as the plant-based cannabinoids like THC and CBD. This is significant, especially as the contra, uh, contribution of gut bacteria to certain cognitive disorders becomes cleaner. In light of the understanding, some scientists are beginning to suspect that the cannabis could be treat a number of conditions by undoing the harmful effects of these bacterial species, uh, plant cannabinoids and gut bacteria. It's not just the endocannabinoids that have a potential to protect their brain from pathogenic uh, gut microbes, but THC and CBD have been found to help and reverse certain cognitive and emotional disorders by directly interfering with the micro microbiome. For instance, a recent study of the Journal of Brain Behavior and Immunity uh, revealed that mice suffering from uh, murine from a multiple sclerosis, MS, tend to contain high levels of bacteria called, I'm not going to be able to pronounce that, sorry, A dot M U C in the gut. These That was the scientific Latin print sorry I'm just i'm not going to butcher that word these particular microbes release a type of toxin that causes inflammation in the brain and are a major cause of ms related symptoms however by administering both thc and cbd the study authors were able to alter the microbe of these mice specifically these uh, cannabinoids cause a notable reduction in a amuc populations within the intestines in these rodents this in turn led to the decrease in uh, concentration of toxins in the brain a significant improvement in ms symptoms so taken together, all the evidence suggests that cannabinoids, including those found in cannabis, may have a major role in the gut-brain axis and appear to protect the brain against many of the harmful uh, metabolites released by an un unhealthy gut bacteria. And this <laughs> is just, like I said, uh, uh, nature. You can go on nature.com and read about this. You can go on Science Direct. So if you have some kind of gut health issues going on, some things going on, do some research on it and... Um, Maybe talk to a holistic person that, that studies cannabis that can help you out with that. And maybe it could help you out. Like I said, I'm real big in the gut health. Try to keep that gut healthy. So um, I thought that was great. Mm -hmm. You know, just they're finding more. Those mice, boy, I feel bad to get injected with shit to make them feel bad. But they seem to get the, like get all the good stuff to help them heal. I mean, it's <laughs> kind of cool. Go mice. Um, Seth Rogen. Uh, been in a lot of movies that we like. Pineapple Express, of course. So many movies he's been in, smoking cannabis. Big believer. 
Uh, his brand house plant is coming to America. So good for you, Seth. Hopefully we get to try it someday. Uh, it'll be legally sold here in the United States. It's already just in Canada. It's a Canada brand. Uh, his creative partner, uh, Evan Goldberg, is launching uh, in California. Expect to see houseplant availability initially through a direct-to-consumer ordering platform on the brand's website beginning Thursday, March 11, 2021. Wow, good for you, Seth. Uh, it's going to be a very, very uh, expensive sativa strain called Pancake Ice. He, he said the strain tested 33%. It's not for the newbie smoker. Uh, $13 per gram uh, in the Canadian marketplace. The company has a line of houseplant-infused drinks also. Uh, Canada also carries uh, the pre-rolls, joints, and capsules. So he's got a nice little product line going. Good for him. Let another star uh, making his name in the cannabis world. So um, once again, happy Women's History Month. Uh, we're going to keep on coming at you with that stuff. And uh, Mrs. Weeman, you got anything else? No. I think that's it. That's it? How's yeah. that edible doing? Uh, yeah. It's good. <laughs> <laughs> I'm... I'm I'm fine. <laughs> You're fine? Yeah, it's just I don't even think I'm going to eat that other portion. I, I might don't sneak need up it. there and eat some of it then. Yeah. Um, it's just good. I'm baked. I took another hit of that vanilla cushion. It's good stuff. But since Mrs. Wee Man doesn't have anything else to say, we're going to end the show. Thank you all for listening. We appreciate you all. Please check us out on uh, Wee Man 420 Chronicles on our Insta, Wee Man 420 Pod on our Twitter. Send us a, a, an email at Wee Man 420 Chronicles at gmail.com. Uh, we got some great stuff coming down the line. We're super stoked to keep on doing this for you every week and uh, loads of fun. It's March. The weather's getting better. Going to be in the 60s this week. I might throw the disc. What, how do, I can't say it. Froth. Thank you. Mr. Weedman likes to froth. Thank you. But I can't not pronounce it for the life of He calls of me. it Frisbee golf. Yes. Because All right, froth. just call it disking. Disc disking. golf. <laughs> yeah, just go throw the disc. Yeah, I can't say the word. Uh, but I'm going to do some. You can say it. No. I won't. <laughs> so all the true disc golfers out there can make fun of me. Call me a noob. So, but uh, we appreciate you listening as always. Thank you so much. As Paulie always says, smoke smart. Puff puff and away. Puff puff pass.